He was the founder of parliamentary democracy. Fire! He killed a king and by his actions created a constitutional monarchy. He was a hero and the father of the modern British army. He pacified Ireland. On no figure in British history is opinion so divided. He is Oliver Cromwell. But some say he was a rebel, a religious bigot, and a slaughterer of the innocent. I'm Major Gordon Corrigan. I've always been fascinated by military leadership. I'm going to find out what made Cromwell, with no previous experience of soldiering, into the finest military commander of his age. In the mid-1600s, Britain was in the grip of a vicious civil war. The supporters of the monarchy, the Cavaliers, fought for power against the parliamentarians, or roundheads. Oliver Cromwell was the most remarkable of many remarkable men who bore arms in the civil wars of the mid-17th century. His achievement was first and foremost a military one. Within two years, he rose from being a lowly captain gathering together a troop of volunteers to being the senior cavalry commander for the parliamentarians against the king. In my opinion, one reason for his remarkable success was his personality. He was so tough, his soldiers called him Old Ironsides, and so down to earth that he demanded his portrait be painted warts and all. There are more clues to Cromwell the man in a tourist trail in Huntingdon, his hometown. Admiring remarks made by his contemporaries are inscribed on special stones. A great man risen from a very low and afflicted condition. But hang on, this is the descendant of Henry VIII's Chancellor, Thomas Cromwell. He's got at least one titled uncle. He's a landowner. He doesn't exactly come from a low and afflicted condition, surely. It's an exaggeration, but there's an, an important truth in it. He, is, he comes down from a younger son, and in those days, the younger son doesn't get the wealth, the elder one does. Uh, I mean, he's, he's not in poverty, and that overstates it, but the idea is that he is someone um, who is connected to riches, but has very little wealth himself. One would certainly see him as someone who wouldn't normally exercise any real political clout in that, in that society, let alone be head of state. To understand how and why Cromwell became such a great military commander, it's necessary to understand the politics of the time. King Charles I had dissolved Parliament. Men like Cromwell, who wanted a less autocratic government, came to realise that only war could moderate Charles's rule. The causes of the civil war were social, religious and economic. But essentially, it was all about power. A weak and incompetent king clinging to his divine right to rule was opposed by a combination of people who wanted power for themselves. Some of them were simply covering personal greed and ambition with a cloak of morality and righteousness, while others genuinely believed that royal government was oppressive and that the king had to be controlled. This is Broughton Castle in Oxfordshire, where men like Cromwell met to plot the downfall of the king. Lord Say, this is your ancestor. Uh, Nathaniel Fiennes, who was a, a prominent parliamentarian. Why did he and Cromwell oppose the monarchy and ultimately want to get rid of it? Well, they opposed it because Charles I ruled without parliament for 11 years. It was a totally autocratic society. If you wanted to express your opinion, you, you had no means of doing so. There was no parliament where anybody could express their opinions. Uh, and I think it was natural for a liberal-minded man to oppose the king and, in the long run, to support Cromwell. Mm. Cromwell's success as a great commander was partly due to sheer strength of character. The fact that men like Nathaniel Fiennes, his social superiors, were prepared to back him is proof of that. 
Oh, there's old Ironsides. Yes, that's a contemporary picture of Crumble by Walker, who was the court painter, as it were. Tradition has it that the parliamentary leaders gathered up here before the Civil War. Nobody could listen in on these three outside walls, just one sentry outside the door, and then you could speak in private and plot against your autocratic king. And I see you've got a portrait of Cromwell over there. What would you think your ancestor, Nathaniel, would have actually thought of Cromwell? I, I, I would have thought he was an upstart, but perhaps that would be overstrong. No, I think they felt that he was the man who, to, lead, to lead them, which he clearly was, wasn't he, in the second half of the Civil War, and therefore they followed him. Oliver Cromwell, I think, truly did believe in morality and in the righteousness of what he was doing. And he was certainly unequalled in his ability to inspire his men with a belief in the justice of their cause and in the certainty of their eventual triumph. This ability to inspire the common soldier is a key attribute of a great commander, one that Cromwell demonstrated from the very start when he organized a troop of horse to fight the king. So I suppose this won't have changed too much since Cromwell's day. No, I mean, it, when he becomes a soldier, it's in this very square. It may well have been on a market day like this. And it's in the Falcon Inn over there that he gathers his first troops together. And uh, it's from here the Civil War began, as far as Cromwell was concerned. So what is this? Knowing not where heaven's choice may light, girds yet his sword and ready stands to fight. What does that actually mean? <laughs> I think it means that he doesn't know what the outcome will be, he doesn't know where the troops are needed, he doesn't know where they'll serve, just there is a cause to be fought for. So when he raises that first troop here, it's his first foray into matters military, he raises a troop, so he's commanding 40, maybe 50 men, and yet within two years, he's a senior commander, how does he do it? Yes, in two years from captain to lieutenant general. And I think probably it's not only that he is just exceptional um, in his natural leadership gifts. I think it's also that in those two years he's given an enormous amount of freedom here. Because this is largely an area under parliamentary control, the senior officers go away to join the fighting elsewhere, leaving him in control. And then there are the royalists coming down from the north, and he has to guard all the river barriers, and he has to repel, you know, uh, attempts to break into the area. And every time he does one of these things, he succeeds. Cromwell was in the right place at the right time to get military experience and to develop his natural talent as a leader. Now, many of his contemporaries had these skills too, but Cromwell had something more, vision. And nowhere is this better demonstrated than in his recruitment and training of troops, and in his eventual command of the new model army, which by combining all sorts of local forces into one, produced England's first truly national modern army. There were four basic principles underlying Cromwell's military policy. First of all, only well-behaved men were allowed to serve. Secondly, soldiers had to believe in the morality of the cause. Thirdly, for the first time, there was a proper rank structure and proper rules and regulations. And finally, he emphasised teamwork. Royalist cavalry individually were far better than the parliamentarians. But Cromwell's men, by acting as a team, could see off far larger bodies of royalists who were generally pretty reluctant to take orders from anybody. Cromwell was one of the first modern protagonists of military professionalism. The Civil War had been raging for three years with no decisive outcome. It was at Naseby in 1645 that Cromwell would use the cavalry of the new model army to dramatic effect. It was a decisive and glorious victory that would be the turning point of the war and ultimately change the way England was ruled. On the 14th of June, 1645, the Parliamentarian army, with Cromwell in command of the cavalry, met the Royalist army under Prince Rupert. The Parliamentarians were spread along this ridge. Cromwell had the cavalry of the right wing off to the east and the 10,000-strong Royalist army 
was on the northerly ridge. At first, things went well for the Royalists. Prince Rupert's cavalry charged the parliamentarians' left wing and drove their horse off the field. But then, in typical Royalist cavalry fashion, they went off on a private jolly to plunder the parliamentarian baggage train. And they didn't come back, leaving their own infantry unsupported. God save the king! The Royalist infantry launched a full-scale attack on the parliamentarians. Cromwell seized the moment and attacked with his cavalry, driving off the Royalists. The parliamentarian infantry then advanced and they started to push the Royalists all the way back. The Royalists, who weren't killed, wouldn't surrender until the king could get away. But at the end of the day, the king had lost his best infantry and effectively, the war. It was a magnificent victory for Cromwell and the new model army. But something a lot less savoury also happened at Naseby. And it's a hint of a darker side to Cromwell, a ruthlessness as a commander. The parliamentarians, chasing the fleeing remnants of the Royalist army, caught up with the Royalist baggage train, which was manned by civilians, including women. The parliamentarians killed the men and they cut the noses and the lips off the women, thinking they were Irish. In fact, they were probably Welsh. Cromwell wasn't there. He didn't personally do it, but he didn't do much to punish the perpetrators. Now it was just a matter of time before Parliament was victorious and the king called to account, tried and executed at Westminster. Naseby wouldn't be the last occasion that Cromwell showed brutality rather than humanity on the battlefield. He now embarked on the most ruthless campaign in Ireland ever undertaken by the British. Cromwell's professionalism secured victory at Naseby, but he also revealed the ruthlessness for which he became infamous in Ireland. So does this brutal streak undermine his right to be called a great commander? Some of the things he did are pretty unpleasant. So what happened in Ireland? Well, in Ireland, he enters into a cycle of violence. The most recent thing had been a massacre of Protestants by Catholics. And he comes to avenge that, and he says so specifically. This one says toleration was his masterpiece. That's got to be a joke. The man was a thoroughgoing bigot, wasn't he? No, he's tolerant in England, but not in Ireland. That pretty much sums it up, I think. Cromwell conducted a highly successful military campaign in Ireland that crushed a royalist revival. But his brutal suppression of Irish Catholics left a legacy of hatred that remains to this day. You were always kind of terrified at the thought of Oliver Cromwell when we were kids ever coming back again, you know. So it was so horrible. Oliver Cromwell, he wouldn't be too popular in, the, in this country. He destroyed the whole town, more or less, you know yeah. what I mean? Killed everyone in it and yeah. burnt the place to the ground, so... Oliver Cromwell's reputation in Ireland is very, very bad. Very bad. He would be regarded as being a, a tyrannical conqueror. I can't tell you any more. My memory doesn't go that far. <laughs> this is Drogheda, a few miles north of Dublin. It was held by a royalist garrison under Sir Arthur Aston. Now, he only had one leg, but he was a tough old soldier. He said, he who can take Drogheda could take hell. Cromwell would give him hell. On the 19th of September, 1649, Cromwell laid siege to the town. He lined up his cannon here on Cromwell Mount and he began to bombard the town walls. <laughs> Meanwhile, the infantry had moved off down this hill to their position for the attack. Once the cannon had managed to breach the walls, it was time for the assault. The troops started off down here, laden down with muskets, ammunition, swords, helmets, all the kit, 
and then they have to get all the way up that hill under very heavy fire from the defenders on the wall. Get It's no wonder the first two attacks were just blown away. This is where they were trying to break through the walls. Fire! And now Cromwell passionately took command. Sword in hand, he led a third and final charge on the breach. There was fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting here, but eventually the English prevailed. Thousands of parliamentarian soldiers flooded through the gap and on to the town. The defenders retreated here to Mill Mount, and Cromwell ordered that no prisoners were to be taken. His soldiers beat Sir Arthur Aston to death with his own wooden leg, and then proceeded to put everyone else within reach to the sword. The defenders retreated still further, across the river to St Peter's Church, where nearly a thousand of them were killed by Cromwell's soldiers. The last few Irish troops took refuge in the steeple, and Cromwell had the pews set on fire to try and smoke them out. Most of them were, but some of them were burnt to death. Over 3,000 people perished in Drogheda. Cromwell had every surviving officer shot, and one in ten of the soldiers clubbed to death. The rest he sent to Barbados, and not on holiday either. Does all this undermine my claim that Cromwell is one of our great commanders? I don't think so. Cromwell did achieve his military aims, and some people are now questioning the well-known stories of his brutality. This is actually one of the cannonballs that was found in the area, oh. and it's very heavy. Oh, that's a 32 pounder. It is indeed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can imagine the damage that would do to one of those old medieval walls. That... Well, yes. Now, it, here locally, I mean, I suppose in Ireland generally, but particularly in Drogheda, mm -hmm. Cromwell is seen as a, as a butcher, as a criminal, uh, as, as a dishonourable, thoroughly nasty piece of work. Yeah. And he wouldn't be top of Ireland's list of most popular men no, in history. No, he I wouldn't, yeah. But you take a, a rather different view. I believe Cromwell was framed. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there is no substantial evidence to corroborate the idea that any civilians actually lost their lives at Drogheda. Um, Cromwell made very definite attempts not to. As soon as he arrived in Ireland, he told the soldiers not to do any wrong or violence towards country people whatsoever if they're not in arms. But Tom's is not the commonly held view. I don't think there's any doubt that civilians were killed. Uh, Cromwell, in his own letter, says that 2,500 soldiers were killed, uh, plus various uh, surgeons, uh, officers, and many inhabitants, in his own words. So we're looking at something in the difference between 2,500 uh, and 3,500, something in the range of perhaps 500 to 1,000 civilians. Would there have been many civilians in Drogheda anyway by the time the troops get into the town? I suspect that most of them would have been gone, to be honest, because there was a siege here eight years earlier when the town was reduced to eating um, rats and horses and dogs and, and um, they weren't inclined to hang around. Civilian deaths aside, it's how Cromwell and his men dealt with the enemy soldiers that has led some to label them a war criminal. An attacking force, if they issued an instruction to a defending garrison to surrender, and they didn't, they knew their lives were forfeit. They knew they could die if the attackers succeeded in getting in. And that's exactly what Cromwell did. But the soldiers didn't expect to die if they did surrender. What was undoubtedly dishonourable was the execution of soldiers in cold blood on the mill mount up to an hour after they'd surrendered. And Cromwell, as commanding officer, has, uh, is responsible for the actions uh, of his senior officers. In the understanding of the war as it was in the 17th century, that was uh, a war crime. Cromwell's campaign in Ireland was successful. By modern standards, he may have acted outside the rules of warfare. He may even have acted outside the rules accepted by most of his contemporaries. But there was a point to this brutal behaviour. After Drogheda, the Royalists were so terrified that they never met him again in open battle, and the civil wars were quickly over. Now, Cromwell might not be the sort of man you'd want to spend time with, but that doesn't detract from his ability as a great commander. After all, nice men don't necessarily win wars.
Once his military campaigns were over, the rest of his life was political. He became Lord Protector, the most powerful man in England. He abolished the monarchy, the Church of England and the House of Lords, and England was proclaimed a republic. But it didn't last long. Cromwell died in 1658. He'd fought in over 30 battles to establish how he thought England should be ruled. But when he died, the brief experiment with republicanism died with him. Within two years, the monarchy was restored. He was buried in Westminster Abbey. But it was not to be his final resting place. His body was dug up, and his severed head ended up at the Houses of Parliament. And this is the death mask of Oliver Cromwell. And it is a permanent memento of what he looked like when he died before the macabre activities of uh, Charles II's government, who uh, exhumed him from his grave in Westminster Abbey and uh, chopped his head off and stuck it on a spike above Westminster Hall. It was a barbaric way for Charles's government to behave. Well, it was a remarkably medieval sort of thing to do. You know, it's certainly something he never did to any of his enemies, and uh, certainly, you know, it's rather in contrast with the old uh, idea of Charles II marrying London restoration comedies. Whatever one's views on Oliver Cromwell, whether we are by instinct roundheads or cavaliers, we cannot deny that he was a natural soldier, a great leader, and a successful commander. The new model army, with its emphasis on professionalism, training, and discipline, led by men who knew their business, was the direct precursor to today's British army, which, while unquestionably a royal army, still carries in its bones much of the ethos of Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell deserves his place as one of Britain's great commanders.